Let's go ahead and get into God's Word here in Matthew chapter 2. Go ahead and open your Bibles there in Matthew chapter 2. We're going to read about how wise men still seek Him. Wise men still seek Him. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Where we read. Everybody there? Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. Make sure your seatbelts are fastened securely. Keep your hands and arms in the car at all times until the ride has come to a full and complete stop. Here we go. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes from the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, Well, it's in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Well, then Herod, when he secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Well, when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over the, where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. And Father, we thank you again for not just this this wonderful, true, actual event of your incarnation, but for all of the Word of God. For you, Jesus, are truly the embodiment of the Word of God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And Lord, as we read your Word, wherever we read in your Word, Old Testament, New Testament, we are reading about you, Lord Jesus. And we are honored and privileged to be here today to read your word. And now I pray that you would please open up for us your word. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to us, your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, the birth of Jesus was accompanied by much worship. It seems to be the central theme of those who came to visit baby Jesus. As you remember from the beginning, a multitude of the heavenly hosts broke forth in praise and they said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. We did it once together before. Let's sing it or, or say it at least together on the count of three. One, two, three. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So the angels worshiped Jesus the shepherds, when they saw and heard the heavenly host, they also came to see Jesus lying in a manger, and they also worshipped him. About 40 days later, when Joseph and Mary brought baby Jesus to the temple to perform the required sacrifices that were required for a baby boy, while there, the Holy Spirit told two elderly people, Simeon and Anna, that Jesus, the one that they were beholding, was indeed the Messiah. And they worshipped Jesus. Simeon held him in his arms and, 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 and just prayed a beautiful thing, worshipping the baby Jesus. And then later on, so did Anna. Each of them responded by worshipping the Lord for keeping his promises that one day indeed the Messiah would come. Now, about one to two years later, the Magi, the wise guys... They traveled from the east, and they came and worshipped baby Jesus. Well, at that time, he was one or two years old. You know how we have our nativity scenes where you have, 
you have the baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph, and you have the shepherds and, and also the wise men there. Well, the wise men really weren't there. They didn't come for another one or two years later. And so in our home, what we do is we have those nativity scenes. We put baby Jesus, Mary, Joseph, and, you know, the angel and the shepherds are there. But then we put the wise men in another room. <laughs> and, you know, they, they'll come in their time, but not right then. That wasn't when they came. They came later. Now, throughout history, the proper response to remembering Jesus' birth is worship. It's one thing to know. But it's another thing to give one's heart. And that's what worship is. The word worship in the original Greek language is pros kuneo. Pros meaning toward and kuneo to kiss. It is affection. It is lo- it's showing love and affection. That's what worship is when we bow down, when we humble ourselves, when we stand, when we lift up our hands, when we're singing songs of praise. That's what worship is. It's, it's showing affection to our Lord who loves it who desires that all men worship him, all women worship him in spirit and in truth. And the proper response to understanding that eternal God has come to this earth to seek and save that which is lost, the proper and really only response is worship. And today we're looking at one of these worship scenes where the wise men from the east, the magi, they came to worship Jesus. In verses 1 through 8, we read about a wise man or wise men and a wicked king. Wise men and a wicked king. Verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. This term wise men comes from the original penned Greek language, the word magos. Now the plural is magi, and we're more familiar, of course, with magi, several wise men, probably way more than three. Now, they brought three gifts, but they traveled in this huge entourage with, with all their peeps and, and lots of camels and donkeys. And when they came into Jerusalem, they created quite a stir because it was a huge caravan that came there. Now, this magi, this title, was something that the Babylonians, Medes, Persians, and other ancients gave to their priests to their teachers, their physicians, their astrologers, their seers, their interpreter of dreams, their soothsayers, and all. They were sometimes called magicians, but not in the sleight-of-hand, card-trick, deceptive sort of magicians that you and I might think about. But these were more like the ancient equivalent to modern-day scientists. And these magi came from Babylon, no doubt being greatly influenced by the prophecies of one Daniel, which he made some 500 years earlier when he was living in Babylon, when Israel was held captive in Babylon for 70 years. So Daniel had quite an influence 500 years later after his ministry, and even still does today. Notice in verse 2 that God prepares a special star, a bright light, to guide the Magi to the one who is the light of the world. So it was fitting that a bright light guided them to the light of the world. Also in verse 1, we're introduced to King Herod, a name we see many times in the Gospels and also in the book of Acts. Now, we might be confused thinking, wow, this guy must have lived for, oh, I don't know, 100 or so years. He keeps popping up over the course of a long period of time. Well, Herod was not just one person. Herod was more of a family name, and there are at least seven different Herods that are mentioned in Scripture. Now, the one mentioned here at the birth of Jesus is none other than Herod the Great. Called great for two reasons. Number one, many building projects. Great building projects, including expanding the Jewish temple in Jerusalem to something far greater than they had ever seen. But also he was called Herod the Great because of his great cruelty. He had many wives, and he had many children. But he was paranoid that maybe one of his family members might try to off him so that they could take the throne. And so Herod, in fear, in paranoia, had many of his wives and children killed. People said at that time, it's safer to be Herod's pig than it is to be Herod's son. And so this maniacal 
dictator sort of a person there, paranoid, whatever he was, now sees this entourage of magi coming from the east and they're proclaiming that there's this king who was born in Israel and boy, was he unnerved. Now when the king heard this, verse 3, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Why? Because he perceived a threat to his rule and reign. He's a fool because wise people, they welcome the reign of God over their lives. They're like, Lord, you know, I've, I've tried to rule. In, uh, this is my thinking when early on as a young man, Lord, I've, I've tried to rule over my life and I've made a mess of it. Why don't you take control? Because you can probably run my life better than I sure can. And oh, indeed has he. So wise people welcome the rule of God over their lives, but the wicked and foolish, they fear God's intrusion. They don't want him to have anything to do with their lives. Don't tell me how to live. I got this figured out. And, you know, some of these people, they live in the South, and they say, oh, sure, I believe in God. But yet, Jesus has no rule and reign over their lives. Paying lip service, but not life service. And Jesus warned that he will come back, and many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. And so we're living in a day when this is true even among this area. A lot of people claiming to believe in Jesus, but they are not walking with him. And they're sure not talking like him. Some of the words that spill out of their mouths, man, they make sailors and truckers blush. <laughs> and yet they're churchgoers. God forbid that we should be like that. God forbid that we would resist the rule and reign, that we would be fools and say, no, you can, you can save my soul, but don't tell me how to run my life. No, no, no. Again, God can do a much better job ruling and reigning over us than we ever could. And so this Herod the Great, a wicked man, instead of rejoicing that the king of kings had been born now, he's threatened. In fact, later on, we'll read that he want to kill baby Jesus. Look, don't be a Herod. Don't resist God's authority over your life. Instead, be a magi, a wise man, a wise woman. Seek him and worship him. Verse 4, And when he, Herod, had, in, had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So now he hears from the magi, the king of the Jews has been born. So he gathers all the religious Jewish leaders and all. Well, where is the Messiah? In the Bible, it must say that, and indeed it does. They said, in Bethlehem of Judea. Beth, who knows what the word Bethlehem means? Anybody? What does it mean? House of bread. How fitting that in the house of bread, that the very bread of life would be born. And they said, for thus it is written by the prophet. And they're quoting now from the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So they knew where. But guess what they didn't do? They knew where the Messiah was to be born, but guess what they did not do? They didn't go to where he was born. They knew the Magi had come. They knew that Herod was asking these questions. They had seen the star that was hovering around and then over Bethlehem. They had seen all these things. But isn't it interesting? They knew all about this, yet they did not bother to make the five-mile journey to go and find out for themselves. You know, it's possible to be religious and to know the Bible, but yet have no heart for God. It's possible to know the right things, but yet still, as the saying goes, be as lost as a blind goose in a hailstorm. And if you've ever seen Old Yeller, you know where that reference comes from. And that's my Christmas gift to you this morning. <laughs> there are people who know the right things, but they don't love the Lord. People that will point to, well, when I was a child, I was baptized. I went to a camp. I wrote my sins on a piece of paper, threw it in the fire. I sang kumbaya. I did all these things. And as a kid, I have papers from. Isn't that funny? Papers? <laughs> papers? We don't need no stinking papers. 
What good are papers? Put them in the bottom of the birdcage. That's what they're good for. The Bible says if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, he is accursed. God doesn't care about your papers. We care about papers when it comes to dogs, pedigrees. Not for people. Not church memberships. The bottom line question this morning is, do you love Jesus? Because nothing else matters. Do you love him? Have you given him your life? You know, when you were, let's say you're married, you know, when you were dating, you said, I love you. You said that. You convinced them somehow, some way that you really love them. You deceived them. Whatever you did, they actually believed through your actions, through your words, that you loved them. And they agreed to marry you. And then years later, they may say, how come you say you never marry or you know, don't love me? And your response should not be, hey, when we got married, I told you I loved you. If it changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> that should not be your response. But there's some men like that, aren't they? And there's some people that have a cold heart toward God. They don't really love him. They're not showing. They're not doing. They're not saying. Because they really don't believe. Is he truly the God of the universe who has come to take on human flesh to pay for our sins? Is he really who he claimed to be that three days later he rose from the dead? Is he truly who he claimed to be? Well, you de decide for yourself by whether or not you love him. If you don't love him, it shows that you don't believe that. But if you believe that, then certainly you will love him. So these religious rulers, they knew all the right things. They even knew where. They knew when. But they didn't go. And then Herod, after con, you know, consorting with the, the religious guys, when he had secretly called the wise men, he determined from them what time the star appeared. Okay, when did all this start happening? And they said about you know, a year or two ago. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me, that I may come and worship him also. Like the politicians, liar, liar, pants on fire. What a liar and a hypocrite this man was. Well, in verses 9 through 12, wise men worship Jesus with precious gifts. Now, before some of you start saying, uh-oh, he's going to ask for tithes and offerings. He's going to yank the agape box off the wall and pass it around. No, calm down. We're not that kind of a church. Verse 9. Now when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Or as we might say, they cut loose. They did not hold back. They were not singing songs and looking at their watches. <laughs> when is this guy going to be done? I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Man, I sure hope that turkey is going to be done by the time I get home. To worship you. Man, why is he wearing a tie with chili peppers on his? Oh, oh my soul, rejoice. How do they change the lights here? Do they use a pole or do they have a lift or something? <laughs> Take joy, my king. How long are they going to have these poinsettias up here? It's about three or four weeks. They're looking kind of shabby. Don't they water them? In what you hear. I'll stop. No. They weren't doing any of that. They had exceedingly great joy. When you were dragged here this morning, did you come with exceedingly great joy? Oh yeah, we don't have a little baby Jesus here, but we have the very God of the universe present among us. He is ever present. He is here. Yeah, he's with you on the way and when you leave and wherever you go and at Walmart or what have you. But he's here among our brothers and sisters in Christ in a way that we don't get to experience when we're by ourselves. 
Jesus said, when two or more gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. He's with us in a way that we don't necessarily get to experience on our own. These are treasured moments that are rare. Do we come with exceedingly great joy? That's our challenge, to come with exceedingly great joy, to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And when they came into the house, again, he's not in the manger, he's not in a cave, it's two years later, they're in a house. Came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. This is the correct worshipful posture. Us down looking up to Jesus. And when they opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. Interesting gifts for a, for a two-year-old, for a toddler. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Interesting gifts, huh? Now gold, hey, gold's good, right? Anybody here not want gold? Any of you have gold you don't want anymore? Okay. Gold truly is a gift fit for a king. And Jesus is the king of kings. Also, gold is good to have on hand, especially if you need to flee with your family for your child's life down to Egypt, and there you need to live. So God knew. And this would happen as we read on here in Matthew, where Herod, he's threatening to kill all the babies in Bethlehem to do away with the Messiah. And an angel warns Joseph in the middle of the night and says, take your, your son and, or, or take your wife and her son. Again, it's not Joseph's son, it's God the Father's son. So take your wife and her son down to Egypt with you until, until I tell you to come back. And so that gold came in handy. Now, frankincense comes from the gum of a certain tree. And when it's burned, it gives off a really fragrant aroma. It was burned by the priests in the temple when they prayed. Symbolic of prayer. Or let our prayers be raised before you as incense, the Bible says. And so by giving frankincense, the wise men were prayerfully seeking the one who came to tabernacle to dwell with men and who also is himself our great high priest. So that's what the frankincense, plus probably other things that it represents as well. And then there was the third gift, myrrh. It comes from the gum of a different tree, which when it is burned, it smells bitter, gives off a pungent, bitter aroma. It was also mixed with, with uh, wine to create a numbing effect, used as a drug to numb pain. It was also used in the embalming process. And so by giving Jesus myrrh, it foreshadows at least three things. Number one, the bitter suffering that he would endure to pay for our sins. Number two, the soldier's offer of wine mingled with myrrh, with, as they call it also, gall, a pain-numbing concoction, which, by the way, Jesus refused. When he knew what it was, he would not drink it. You know why? Because he wanted to feel the full effects of our sin in his suffering. He didn't want to numb the pain, and he didn't, because he needed to feel it all. So bitter suffering, the soldiers offer. And then finally, myrrh used in the embalming process, foreshadowing how Jesus would be buried. But only for three days. Only three days. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, and he was going to give it back <laughs> in three days. So the wise men gave God gifts which were fit for the king of kings and for the great high priest and also for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so these men, they worshiped the Lord. They gave them these gifts. And then that night, I guess, being divinely warned, verse 12, in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed to their own country another way. Thus, Herod's evil plot was thwarted. You know, no matter what evil man tries to do, God is still on the throne. I think we need to remember that. You know, we, we, we've had some... Horrible, bitter times in our country. Lots of division, lots of evil, a lot of selfishness. 
a lot of pride. And, and it's just, it's bubbling and it's, it's just awful. But regardless of what's going on in the world, we got to remember Jesus sits on the throne. We have to remember that because it's true. And we are not overcome with worldly things like the world is. We're not all upset and, and fearful of, oh, this is happening and that's happening. Oh, this is horrible. How can we survive? Look, Jesus loves you. And he's a king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he sits on the throne of the universe. And if you've invited him into your life, he sits on the throne of your life. You're fine. Even in the sin-cursed world, you are good to go. You are fine. So no matter what evil man tries to do, God is still on the throne. But the big question this morning is this. Is Jesus the king on the throne of your life? Is he your king? Is he your Lord? Is he your master? Is he your king? The wise men knew that the time had come for Christ to be born. They had known of Daniel's prophecies. They saw the star and all. Wise men today, wise women today, also know that now is the time for Jesus to take up residence in our own lives. In John 14, verse 23, we read, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Wow, that's cool, isn't it? God making his home in you. And then in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. The Lord wants to eat with you, fellowship with you, be family, be our father. Some of us have had great fathers. Others of us have had horrible fathers. But the greatest of all fathers wants to be your father and my father today. And wise men and women not only know that it's time for Jesus to rule and reign over our lives, but also that he's coming back soon. And he is going to return with us, the church, to establish his kingdom over all the earth. And eventually it will be said and it will be true in Revelation 11, verse 15. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Isn't that cool? I mean, what a, amen. So, this morning, have you received him? Have you made him your king? Are you truly worshiping him? If we will give, Christmas all about gifts, right? Let us give to the Lord our most precious gift. Not gold, not your bank account, not your car, not your house. But the rule and reign over your life. Give him that. Lord, take me. Be my Lord, my master, my king. I surrender, I submit to you. Give him your most precious gift, your life. And in return, he will bless your socks off. Forgiveness of your sins, for one. Imagine, removal of guilt. A lot of people suffer. Much mental illness is really the result of guilt. Not knowing how to deal with guilt. You know how to deal with guilt? Give it to Jesus. Let him forgive you. Guilt's gone. It'll be gone. So forgiveness of sins. Number two, your name written in his book of life. Number three, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Number four, peace with God and also the peace of God. I guess that's four and five. Uh, six, his mercy, his grace, his love, and eternal glory, which is out of this world. Oh yeah, we'll suffer in this life. No question about it. Jesus warned us if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. You know, uh, and that's just how it is for the believer. Because we trust in Jesus, the world hates us. It's just how it is. But you know what? We're going to heaven. So it doesn't matter what happens here and now. The only thing that matters is heaven. So give Jesus your life. Trust him today. Make him your king, your Lord, your master. Surrender to him. Give him that gift. And he will bless you in ways you cannot possibly imagine, but you will experience forever and ever. Amen?
Father, thank you for your word today. And Lord, what a, what a wonderful, wonderful passage of scripture that not only, Lord, reminds us of you coming to this earth the first time, but also, Lord, we can't help but, but realize that you're coming again. And Lord, that your return to this earth to rule and reign, you're, you're, it's not going to be a democracy. You're not going to have a bunch of advisors. You're certainly not going to have some cabinet. You are going to rule and reign with an ironclad rule and reign over the earth. And there will be all truth and all justice and all righteousness and all holiness and all love and all peace, all joy. Everything, Lord, will be perfect. And yet, God, you want to rule and reign over us this morning, right now that we might have a little bit of that heaven on earth in our own lives. And Lord, if there's any here this morning that have resisted your lordship, I pray that today they would, they would give up. They would surrender. They would admit defeat, raise the white flag and say, I give up. Would you please be the Lord of my life? Lord, if they will do that, then you, you're going to change them forever. And so, Lord, we pray that that would happen here and in every church that is preaching the, the resurrected Jesus Christ. Lord, every church that is doing that, may people come to faith in you today and surrender lives to you today. Lord, thank you that you love us. And we just want to respond by saying, we love you too. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen.